If I'd have told you 10 or 15 years ago that the top two selling vehicles in Australia were in this group behind me, you probably would have thought I was mad. And yet, along with medium SUVs, this segment, dual cabs, is the battleground in 2022 in Australia. They are more popular than they have ever been. Sam, tell us what we're testing and why we're testing it. We've got eight four-wheel drive utes here, Trent, and like you said, this is such a popular segment for Australian buyers and family buyers as well. So in this test, we're not really looking at the off-road stuff. You we'll, know, that we'll is a lot there. of fun. Yeah, I know, I am looking forward to that. <laughs> but, but this time we're really focusing in on the daily grind stuff. Right. So things like technology, things like safety, comfort, refinement, what they're like to drive. What's the second row like? Which one's the most spacious in that regard? There are a lot of questions for these things as family cars, and we're gonna to get to the bottom of which one is the best. That's right, mate, and let's look at the contenders. We'll start over there with the GWM Ute. Underestimate that newcomer to the segment at your peril. I reckon it's gonna punch particularly hard in terms of value for money. Next to it, on the subject of value for money, Mitsubishi Triton, that's always been our recommendation for buyers who are on a tight budget, and it still is very sharply priced. One that Sam's leaning on that, is it making you look good or are you making it look good? I'll take all the credit. Yeah, either or, exactly. The Ford Ranger, it's new to the segment. It's, it looks like it's gonna be the best. It really does on paper, and we're gonna find out. That's what we're doing here. Nissan Navara, another favorite among Australian buyers, and it's always rated really highly for its car-like interior because it feels more car-like to drive. So keep an eye on that one. Sangyong Musso, you might not have thought about that one, but like GWM, that's a bit of a challenger in this segment. Underrated at your peril. Toyota Hilux, well, the most popular vehicle in Australia. Surprise, surprise, of course that's here. It's gonna fight hard right the way to the top. And the twins, last but not least, our reigning dual cabs of the year, Isuzu D-Max Mazda BT50. They're the same under the skin. There are some subtle differences though. Let's get into the testing. Well, here we have the most expensive car on this mega test, the Ford Ranger, and the most affordable, the Sangyong Musso. But people tend to forget that the cost of a vehicle doesn't just start and finish at the purchase price. There are a whole host of value for money considerations to take into account when you're purchasing a dual cab ute. Not only is the purchase price significant, but you also have the warranty, servicing costs, resale value, and even fuel use. These are really important considerations for a time which feels like everything is getting more expensive. Let's break it down and have a look at the highlights. With a low purchase price of $45,490, you might think that the GWM Ute represents good value. Unfortunately, it placed eighth and last in our value for money analysis, where resale value and running costs proved the GWM's downfall. On the plus side, it does offer a strong seven year warranty, which could be valuable to owners planning on hanging onto their GWM Ute for the long term. One rung up, the Mazda BT50 sits in seventh place. In stark contrast to the GWM, the BT50 is one of the more expensive utes on the mega test and is let down by comparatively high insurance quote and servicing costs, especially compared to its mechanically identical twin, the Isuzu D-Max. The slight differences in value could make the decision easier between these two twins under the skin. In equal fifth place, we have the Isuzu D-Max and Nissan Navara. On the former, the D-Max scores favourable points for its best on test fuel use and strong six year warranty. On balance, the D-Max is the most expensive ute to insure with a $1747 quote. Worth noting is the fact that Isuzu often runs driveway deals on the x specification, however we've used the official list price in this comparison. The Nissan Navara scores points for its strong resale value bolstered by a recognised brand and prominent service network. It does feature the most expensive servicing cost of all at $1,754 over 45,000 kilometres. The five-year unlimited kilometre warranty is a fair offering in the segment. The Mitsubishi Triton is traditionally viewed as a strong value play in the dual cab ute segment, but is facing stiff competition from the likes of Sangyong and GWM today. In any case, it scored fourth in the ownership value stakes thanks to the best warranty offering and cheap insurance. Keep in mind that you'll have to service exclusively with Mitsubishi if you want that 10-year warranty. Toyota is also a strong player in the after-sales value space, performing strongly across the board and coming in at third place. Service costs are low $260 over the first five services, but you'll have to service every six months or 10,000 kilometers. 
Resale is an incredibly strong 97% after three years, though the Hilux does miss out on any included roadside assistance. A very affordable purchase price backed up by cheap running costs saw the Sangyong Muso score second place in terms of ownership costs. At $43,590, it is the most affordable car to buy on this mega test, and keep in mind that this is the extended tray variant. The sheer value is really impressive. Adding to this value is affordable $1,125 servicing over 45,000 kilometers and a generous seven year warranty. We already know Ford makes great utes outright, but it's brilliant to see that character backed up by this car's value for money equation. Despite its high list price, the Ford Ranger is the best value for money on this dual cab ute mega test. Not only is it the least expensive ute to service, it also performs strongly in roadside assistance, resale value and fuel consumption. It's little wonder so many Australians turn to Ford when looking for a U that's equal parts capable and affordable. We talk about the ways in which this segment has changed, but let me tell you that probably the most visible is right here inside the cabin. Not that long ago, these vehicles, these dual cabs, were simply a work tool that got used to get from A to B and get to site to do a job. But now, a decade or so later, maybe even a little bit longer, they have become not so much a default family vehicle, but they've become, in a lot of cases, a second vehicle in a family or the vehicle that is used to take the kids to sport and go on weekend road trips. And as such, we expect that here, inside the cabin, a lot of the things that we like about cars and SUVs have translated over into the dual cab market, and that's nowhere more evident than right here in the Mazda BT-50. One of the things we really liked about the BT-50 when it was first released, and let's not forget, you'll hear this repeatedly through this test, this is an Isuzu D-Max, but one of the things that we liked about it is that when you sit here inside the cabin, this looks and feels like a Mazda. And that was obviously very important that Mazda execute that when they did their reskinning to the BT-50. It's a comfortable place to be. It's a really well executed cabin. We like the fit and the finish and the choice of materials. The dashboard's really quite stylish. The seats are nicely sculpted and that means it's comfortable for longer distance driving. And the infotainment screen, which to be frank with you, could be a little better. Not the screen itself, the actual functionality of the screen and the graphics, they're pretty good. But if you look around here, you'll notice there's no dial for the volume and that's annoying because having to go looking for a switch here while you're on the move or only use the switches on the steering wheel can be a little bit annoying. When you've got a big knob there and you just spin it around and put it to zero, it makes your life a lot easier. Having said that though, the rest of the functionality of the screen is pretty good. But overall, and you'd expect before we wrap up the BT-50 that the Ford Ranger will move this forward another level because it's brand new. But this has already been around for over a year and it remains a comfortable, functional and really well executed cabin. So the Isuzu D-Max is exactly the same as the Mazda BT-50, the end. No, 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 not so fast, not so fast. There are a couple of differences. You do get this little storage unit up on top of the dash, which you're gonna bake expensive electronic goods on a hot day, that's true, but it's still good storage for things like notepads, pens, keys, things like that. And the other big difference when you jump straight out of the Mazda into the D-Max is how dark it is in here. This is a black cabin and it feels a lot darker uh, and a lot sort of more cave-like, I guess. It's like you're down inside it. Not a bad thing, some people will prefer it. It's just a noticeable difference. I don't really have a preference either way, but you do notice that it's different. The same reasons that we like the Mazda, we like the Isuzu. It's essentially a well put together cabin. It does have functionality in mind. Visibility is good, seating's good, and it really has been designed with the end user in mind. It hasn't sort of been thrown together and then you've got to try to work your way into it. This is a well thought out cabin that is comfortable. The same issues that we had with the infotainment on the Mazda we have, obviously on the Isuzu, it's the same product. Aside from that, this is a pretty solid dual cab that is still right up near the head of the field. One thing's for sure and certain, Toyota knows how to put together a robust functional cabin and that's never more evident than when you're sitting right here inside the Hilux. Now sure, there are some harsh plastics, like this here is nice and soft where you rest your elbow, but up here on top of the door, that's hard plastic. I don't really love the trim on the steering wheel and the dash is a bit hard and scratchy as well. However, there's a lot to like about the utilitarian nature of this. This feels like an interior that can cop a lot of abuse and it'll still be in reasonably good condition 
after copying that abuse. Smartphone connectivity was a much needed addition to the Hilux. It was lacking for some time and then when the competitors started to get it, you felt like the Hilux was way behind the time. So the fact that it does have it is good. The screen is still a little bit old tech, I guess, in the way that it looks and feels. You do get heated seats. You also get tilt and reach adjustment for the steering wheel. And it's a relatively comfortable cabin to be in. Probably not the best seats in the class or the best driving position, but visibility is a real strong point. I'll tell you the one thing you notice when you get inside the Sangyong is how big it is. This <laughs> cabin is enormous. In fact, it feels like it's half a segment bigger than the other dual cabs on this test. It really is roomy in every sense. Now, despite the fact that Sangyong has been in the Australian market for quite some time, it still feels like a challenger brand in this segment, in this dual cab shootout, but I reckon it does pretty well. When you look at the way this cabin's put together, sure, there's some scratchy plastics around the place. You do get a padded armrest, which is a good thing. The rest of it is really quite well laid out. You get a decent screen with easy to use controls, heated seats, plenty of clever storage, cup holders in the right place. I like the layout of the switches on the steering wheel. I think they're well positioned and they don't get in the way. And we always talk about the fact that the Triton is the value pick in this segment. And that might still be the case, but I tell you, the more time you spend with this Sangyong, the more I reckon it's gonna give Triton a real run for its money. One of the areas these dual cabs really need to make a leap forward is right here inside the cabin because we keep saying it, but the people who buy these tend to use them as family vehicles, if not just on the weekend, throughout the week as well. One of the reasons we liked the Navara when it was first released is that it had a real car-like feel to the cabin. And that's good because a Nissan car or a Nissan SUV is a pretty comfortable place to be. It has to be said now though that with newer entrants on the market, and don't forget you've got D-Max and you've got BT50 and then of course all new Ford Ranger, this is starting to feel its age a little bit. Uh, the infotainment system probably not as up to date as the best in the segment. It is still comfortable though, visibility is still good and it's still a generally functional cabin for either daily driving or for longer road trips. But if you're a tradie and you leave home early in the morning in winter when it's nice and cold, no heated seats. Well, the new Ford Ranger, what can I tell you? It is better everywhere than the competition when you're sitting inside the cabin. And that's to be expected. This is an all new dual cab. It set standards really throughout its life previously, and it's seemingly doing it again, starting right here inside the cabin. Now, Ranger pretty much always had the most comfortable seats. Maybe only Amarok was up there with it. These Ranger seats in the new one, they're fantastic. And I think in many ways, the Ranger works because it feels like a scaled down Ford F-150. Why is that a good thing? Well. I think when most Australians think about a truck, they think about a Ford F truck. The dashboard represents that. I really like the portrait orientation of the infotainment screen because when you've got your smartphone connected to it, the top two thirds show that and then the bottom third of the screen still runs the air conditioning control so it's really nicely laid out. You get plenty of storage, you get an interactive driver's display which works really well too. You can tailor that to suit what you like the look of. but it's worth making the point that even though the Ford range is not perfect, there's a couple of little things and you'll be able to read about those in the full review that we think Ford could do a little bit better. This vehicle shows that Ford put a lot of thought and a lot of implementation into this before they released it and they put a lot of planning into it and as such, it's a really well executed cabin. The lifespan of commercial vehicles is generally around about a decade and the negative for the manufacturers with that being the case is that they can start to feel a little bit old amongst newer models if they haven't been significantly updated inside the cabin. And that's true of the Mitsubishi Triton. There's nothing especially wrong with it and it still remains in many ways the smart bargain pick in this whole segment, but it really does feel its age from inside the cabin. The infotainment, the driving position, you feel like you sit on, up on top of the Triton, not down into it. Uh, even though it's got electric seat adjustment, you can't quite get low enough into it. And that sort of affects where your eye line is and the general visibility. The seats themselves are a little bit flat. They're not sculpted as much as some of the best in the segment. And that sort of assists in feeling like you're sitting on them as well. But just in general, the switch gear, the layout, 
the materials, hard plastics, things like that, it is starting to feel its age, even though it still makes a real compelling value statement. I'll tell you what, underrate these new players to this segment at your peril, because if you sit in the cabin of something like the GWM, you find out that it's spacious, it's got heaps of room in it, and there's an element of that that the other established players could really learn from in terms of how much space there is in here. But this is a really high quality cabin. They've clearly gone for an upmarket look and feel. And in most senses, they've absolutely executed that. The screen is good. It's responsive. I like the digital driver's display. That works really well also. It's got enough storage, clever storage, useful storage. You've got wireless charging up there as well as your regular USB inputs. And even though this isn't up at the level with something like the Ranger, which is the new segment standard setter, this is still really impressive, especially for the money that you're spending. And I think the message with a vehicle like the GWM is if you're on a tight budget, you're never going to feel embarrassed that you could only afford this dual cab. When it comes to infotainment, not all dual cab utes are created equal. Our mega test highlighted how wide the gulf has become between the best and the worst. At one end of the divide, the new Ford Ranger has finally given the dual cab brigade the infotainment setup they deserve. The slick portrait style 12-inch screen is a gem. It runs Ford's SYNC 4 operating system which feels sophisticated and sharp. Apple CarPlay is standard as is Android Auto. Both are wireless. There's also satellite navigation and digital radio fitted in this specification. That impressive screen is augmented by an excellent 8-inch digital instrument cluster that hosts a wealth of driving data. You're never left wanting for information. At the other end of the divide is the Mitsubishi Triton's laughably small 7-inch touchscreen. We've seen bigger smartphones than the screen in the Triton. It's serviceable enough with CarPlay and Android smartphone mirroring, but the graphics are showing their age. The system works well enough, although one major gripe is the lack of a physical volume dial. Instead, touch-sensitive controls to the side of the screen perform that function, and, it must be said, not with all that much sensitivity. Like the Triton in general, the infotainment setup is showing its age. The game has moved on, but the Triton system has been left behind. Great Wall and Sangyong both impressed with their fancy looking screens and slick graphics. But, while both featured impressive looking displays, missing out on some key items ultimately saw them marked down. There's no inbuilt sat nav in the Sangyong Musso, and while there are two USB plugs in the front row, the second row misses out on charging options entirely. Likewise, the Great Wall's 9-inch screen looks sharp, but it too misses out on satellite navigation and digital radio. The only dual cab in this mega test without that modern audio tech. Its digital driver display is a matter of style over substance. Looking all high-tech and fancy, but without any of the functionality we've come to expect. No surprise then that the Ford Ranger is the runaway winner in this category. Ford has become the first car maker to treat dual cab owners as adults with a system that is mature, sophisticated and most importantly of all, truly functional. When you're buying a dual cab ute, it's not often you think about the people in the back. To be honest, you're rarely going to find yourself in the back of your own vehicle. But if you do care about the people that may be passengers, or even if you have children, looking at the back seat is an important aspect to any dual cab ute. Right now, I'm sitting in the back of the Mazda BT50, and this seat is one of the most comfortable that I've sat in. Aside from the upholstery color, which you can see here clearly, it is really soft and very comfortable. The backrest is at a great angle. There's plenty of foot room. I've got ample room between the seat and my knees. And the armrest on the side is very soft and comfortable to put my elbow on. And that's important when you're doing long hours in a car. The door pocket is on the small side, but nicely angled so you can reach the top of your bottle and whip that out for a drink when you need it. But one of the most disappointing things for me is this single USB socket. There really should be a dual USB socket in the rear of this console, considering that this is one of the most recently updated utes in this class. All in all, this is a very well executed rear of this cabin. It's very comfortable. The upholstery is fantastic to sit on and the seat shape itself really does hold me in nicely. I don't feel like there's anything sticking into my backside when I'm sitting here right behind the driver. 
I'm in the back of the Isuzu D-Max and this rear seat is just as comfortable as the Mazda BT50. And there's little surprise there because essentially they are the same platform. You've got a very nice angle on the backrest. It's very comfortable to sit on. You've got ample leg room and foot room as well. Again, it's one of the most comfortable dual cab ute seats that I've sat in. And that plush upholstery just adds to the feeling. I'm in the back of the Toyota Hilux SR5, and you've got to say, Toyota really are still trading on their name. This is one of the sparsest back seats that I've sat in during this test. Sure, the seat is comfortable enough. The backrest is reasonably angled, so you're not pushed forwards, and there is just enough leg room. It's probably on par with something like the Triton. Could do with a little bit more. The scalloping of the front seat does aid that sort of knee room that you've got. But in terms of connectivity, this is very poor compared to the rest of the utes in this segment. There is no USB in the back at all. In fact, there's not even a 12 volt plug. And in this day and age, I think that is something that is really missing. Uh, everyone's got iPads. Kids want to read them in the back of the car. If you can't plug them in, you've got no power at all. Now, the armrest is pretty comfortable to the side. It is harder than some of the others. And the foot room underneath the seat is relatively good. I'd say that's average as well. You do have some bag hooks here. They're not really high enough for a jacket, but they're certainly low enough to hang a bag so your shopping doesn't topple out. All in all, it's okay. It's comfortable, but very sparse in terms of the onboard additions that you would expect in a modern dual cab ute. I am in the back of the Sanyong Musa, and this is the surprise package out of all the dual cab utes we have assembled here today. This one feels like and looks like it's got more room than most of the other utes that we've had a look at. The seat is up nice and high in front of me. I can really tuck my feet under there, give me even more space. And there is ample knee room between myself and the driver's seat which I've put in my normal driving position. The seat itself is comfortable. The base of it's very soft. The backrest, I would say, is a little bit hard, but it is at a great angle to make sure that I'm not trying to force myself into a position I shouldn't be in. The armrest as well is nice and long and at the perfect height. And surprisingly, in this vehicle, this has one of the most accessible side pockets that we've seen out of any ute that we've looked at. This is a great example of a rear cabin that's really comfortable, but what is missing is some connectivity in the rear. In the back of this console, we've got two vents, no pocket, no 12 volt plug, and certainly no USB access. If you've got children or even passengers looking to use phones, tablets, and things like that, they've got no power at all. It is a bit of a downfall in the rear of this vehicle, but the comfort makes up for it just a little. I'm sitting in the back of the Nissan Navara Pro 4X and it's a very comfortable space indeed. The leg room is good. The backrest is a little upright. I feel a little bit pushed forwards, but the seat base itself is up nice and high, giving me good visibility. And that's something that I like in these sorts of cars. I want to see what's going on, even if I'm not driving. The armrest is really comfortable. It's well placed, but it does impede access to the door pocket. It's an average size door pocket, but it does have a drink holder down there. Now, this is the only ute in this class that has a rear window. Unfortunately, only accessed by the front of the vehicle, so you have to ask someone to open it, but it does add that air circulation element into this area. From a connectivity point of view, there is only one USB in the back of this vehicle, so if you have two children, there'll be a battle royale for the power. The Ford Ranger Wild Track is the latest ute that's been developed out of the entire segment that we've got here today and it really does show even in the back seat i love the door handles one touch operation so one hand i can open the door and open it that easily without having to use two hands to do that the room in the back is excellent the seat itself comfortable so i've got heaps of leg room there's a nice recess in the back of the front seat that gives me extra space here and i can tuck my feet well under the driver's seat as well now the seat itself i'm elevated position I like preferably. The backrest is more upright than say the Sanyong Muso, but it is still very comfortable. I don't feel like I'm being pushed forward at all. But one thing I really do love about this vehicle is the sockets down here. I've got a USB socket and a USB-C fast charging socket. And in this day and age, I think that is a must have in any vehicle, particularly in the back seat. 
The upholstery is firm, but it's also very comfortable and it really will stand the test of time when you think of people sliding in and out of the back seat on a regular basis. This seat isn't perhaps as comfortable as the Isuzu or the Mazda BT50, but when you consider all the elements at play here, this is my pick of the bunch. The accessibility to power, you've got two sockets there. The comfort factor, the space as well. This car does combine everything together just beautifully. I'm in the back of the Mitsubishi Triton and this seat, whilst high, giving you good visibility and also nicely raked back so your back rest or you don't feel like you're getting pushed forward too far, is actually not that comfortable to sit on. It's quite hard and it's also, it just doesn't feel like it holds your body at all. Leg room also compromised. The seat really does get in the way a fair bit from you putting your feet forward and underneath it. It obviously sits quite low to the floor, but the knee room is reasonably good. The armrest is hard plastic, again, not that comfortable to put your arm on. And the pocket down the side, almost impossible to get to. The rear of this vehicle does, however, have air vents. Ugly, admittedly, but effective. So that gives you some good airflow in the back of this car. From a connectivity point of view, importantly, you've got dual USBs. This is one of the only cars in this segment to have dual USBs in the back, and I do like that. And this pocket here as well in the rear of this console is actually usable. It's not some tiny little shallow recess that you can't use for anything at all. All in all, it's a good effort, but it's certainly not the most comfortable seat you're going to sit in in the back of a dual cab ute. The back of the GWM really surprised me. They've clearly gone for an upmarket look. You've got some quilted stitching and the actual material they've used is nice and soft to the touch. The seat itself is great. It has good support for your legs and the backrest is a very comfortable angle. And the room, the room in here is enormous. My knees don't even get near the seat in front of me and I've put that seat in the position where I would usually drive from. The seat is also quite raised off the floor, so there's a lot of foot room under there, and I would say that's the most foot room out of any ute in this particular set that we're looking at. Armrest again, comfortable, it's padded, you can leave your arm there and sit back and really enjoy a long drive, and the drink holder you can get to very easily in the door pocket. This is a well-executed space, and I particularly like the touch down here, you've got a USB but you've also got a power point down there. Obviously there's an inverter in the vehicle and that is a universal power point mount. So you can put an Australian plug in there and give you power anywhere you need it in the back row. All of the utes that we have here today do have ISOFIX fittings on the outside edge of the rear seat and that's a good thing. But one thing that you do need to consider, especially if you have young children, is a rear facing child seat. In New South Wales, for example, you have to put a child under six months into a rear facing seat. And that really does compromise the space available in the front. We're standing in front of the Sanyong Muso. That's got the largest cabin space. And already to fit this seat in, the passenger is severely compromised. If I go around and I'll jump into that seat, you'll see how much room I actually have. And it's not a lot at all. Now imagine if you had twins, you've got two of these seats facing this direction, your driving position is severely compromised for at least six months. It's an important thing to consider when you're looking at a ute like this and putting baby seats in the back. What we are looking for here with the tubs of these vehicles is pretty straightforward. Along with how many features have been included, things like tub liners, tie downs and power outlets, we are also looking at how well they have been applied and how useful they are in the real world. And let me tell you, there is a wide range of differences on offer. Here's the tub setup of the Mazda BT50, and we've got top spec SP here, and that's got a lot of the extra fruit that other BT50s don't have. And of course, this BT50 is a twin under the skin of the Isuzu D-Max, so this is quite similar to what you'll get in a D-Max X-Terrain. Now, this tub is all fully locked up at the moment. Good thing to do if you've got valuables in the back, people can't get into them. But one issue with this car is that it doesn't unlock with central locking. So to get into the back here, what you need to do, press this button here, get this key out of the key fob, go in there and turn it that way, put that back. And if you want to unlock this one on top, it's the other key, put that in, turn it around. Now, push that down on the top. It does need a fairly solid push. That slides away, down it goes. Now that is the tub of the BT50. It's a pretty good setup overall. You do have a tub liner here, but you only have 
two tie down points. Because this tub liner and this roller cover effectively deletes the other two tie down points in the back corners there. That's not exactly perfect. And it's worth noting that that roller cover does take up a little bit of real estate there on the inside. But it is, from my experience, relatively waterproof. No surprises here that you're going to get a similar experience with the Isuzu D-Max and the Mazda BT-50. They are mechanically very similar vehicles. Now this D-Max here is the X-Terrain model. It's top of the pops for the range and it's got the most kitted out tub here. You've got a roller cover here and now you've got this strap here. Now that is for obviously pulling it back. It is a manual setup overall. Now I'll just open that up again. To give you another look, a little bit noisy, forgive me for that. You've got two tower downs here. You've got no tie downs at the back there. There are only these ones in the corners, but you do have pretty good water sealing and waterproofing. You can see these uh, tubes here. They help channel the water away and out of the contents of your tub. So this tub, yes, it's not perfect, but it is at least securable and lockable against thieves and weather, which is pretty good. Not a whole lot to report on with the back end of this Toyota Hilux. Even though SR5 is a high specification model, you do need to spend even more money on something like a Rogue to get top order stuff with a bit of gear in the back here. Because as you can see, there is no tonneau cover, but it does get worse. No tub liner, no 12 volt outlets in the back of this either. You do have four tie down points there and the tailgate, it's not damped at all. It's a little bit heavy, I suppose. You can lock the tailgate, but you do need to pop the key out of the fob, just like that, and use that key to physically lock it. Here's the tub of the Sangyong Musso. You can get a shorter wheelbase variant of this Musso, but we've got the XLV, which is a long wheelbase and a bigger tub on the back. Now, before I show you the tub, one thing to point out here, press this button on the key fob and you can lock this tailgate. Unlock it as well, obviously, that's a good feature to have and not all utes have it in this mega test. Now this is the tub. As you can see, it's a really good size overall. This XLV has a tub liner and it's also got four tie down points on it, but no tonneau or cover or anything like that. But one thing you might not realize about this tub is how deep the walls are here and how much you can fit in terms of the tub height. It's actually a really good feature, especially if you want to carry things like jerry cans or something like that. You could be able to fit those heightways instead of having to lay them down and potentially risk a bit of spillage or something like that. This tub is actually one of the better ones for space overall. Here is the Nissan Navara and this is Pro 4X. This is the most sort of money you can spend on a Navara before you go into the high performance warrior variations. First thing to note here, this tailgate is only lockable with the key out of the fob. So like we've seen a few times already, pop that out, use that key in there and you can lock and unlock the tailgate. To open it, you do need to pop the top of this tonneau cover off. This doesn't have a fancy roller cover. This is the old school tonneau cover, I suppose you would just call it. Open this up and you can see the tub in here. This does have a nice tub liner. I do like this finish here on the top of the tailgate, just helps save damage in some sort of scenarios. And along with the four tie down points you have, which are typical of most dual cab utes, you have this awesome load rail on each side and that's got two tie down points which are adjustable. You can move those up and down and that's really handy for variable loads and that sort of thing can really come in handy when you're using the tub of this Navara. The Ford Ranger Wild Track is the most expensive ute in this comparison, but it has the tub with the most features. Firstly, you can lock and unlock the tailgate, which makes this tub secure with the fob in your hand. And also press this bottom button twice and you've got an electric roller cover that opens automatically. That is pretty cool. Now I'll unlock this and open the tailgate. It's nicely damped actually, quite light. You'll see here you do have a ruler on the back here. It's small and not the most detailed. And in this wild track, for some reason, this cover here is actually going over it in spots. So I doubt you're actually going to use that for measuring anything too important. Maybe just checking how big that fish is you just caught. You've also got some things here for clamps if you're going to cut some timber on the back or something like that. But inside there are some additional features. So you've got two tie down points on each side, just your usual tie down points that you have in a tub, but you've also got these style movable ones as well. I think Ford has seen this in the Nissan Navara, thought, hey, that's a pretty good idea. I might chuck that in the new Ranger and they are handy to have. So you've got effectively eight tie down points in the back of this Ranger. You've also got a 12 volt access plug there. And there's another button in there that can operate that electric roller cover. But I have to say my favorite 
detail in this tub overall. It's the simplest thing, but I love it greatly. It's this step on the side here. Ford has engineered this into the Ranger. It's nice and sturdy, takes a lot of weight, but if you want to step into the back there, it's as easy as that. How good? Next up is the Mitsubishi Trident. We've got top spec GSR here, but the way this tub is set up kind of gives away the age of this Mitsubishi Trident overall. Now, first things, the locking ability of this tub, or should I say the lack thereof, you'll notice that there is nowhere to put your key on the back here. Oh yeah, is it central locking? Unfortunately not. There is no way to lock this tailgate from the factory. And if you want to get in, you do have to pop this good old fashioned tonneau cover up like this. It's got a bit of a sailplane style sort of setup here. And I'll just peel this other side off as well to show you what's going on. Now, I'm not sure if this is completely weatherproof, this setup here, but it's definitely not thief proof. You cannot lock this tailgate at all. Now I'll open it up. We do have a tub liner, that is good to see. I'll peel this up and away here. And we've got no power outlets and four tie down points in the back. Not bad, but also not the best in the segment. Here's the tub of the GWM Ute. First thing to note here, you cannot lock the tailgate, not manually, not via the key and not via the fob either. You just can't do it. And I also notice that the tailgate is a little bit loose and rattly as it sits there, but this Ute has one thing that the others don't. Push this button here on the back and you've got a handy pop down step. Now that makes life a little bit easier if you want to step up and into the tray for whatever reason. That is a pretty cool thing. I've only actually seen this on full-sized American utes before. So I'll pop that back in and show you the rest of the tray here. We do have a tub liner, which is great to see, and we do have some damping on the tailgate here. Now, in terms of tie-down points, you've got four, there's one in each corner there, and there's no 12-volt access, and that is about it. Safety is incredibly important to us at Drive, even though it's not the most glamorous subject, and that's even more so the case in a dual cab mega test that is focused on family buyers. Behind me, you can see our top four for safety. Let's take a look at some of the highlights and lowlights we found during testing. Safety is as important as ever in this segment. Four wheel drive utes have been the backbone of many businesses and industries over the years, but the modern day ute now pulls double duty as a family car as well. ANCAP crash safety ratings are a core source of information for our safety testing in this mega test, but it's not the only thing we measured. Other elements like tire pressure monitoring, driver attention warning, parking sensors as well, these are all things that we also included and counted in our testing. The Ford Ranger, which is the newest ute on this mega test, had the most comprehensive array of safety equipment as standard, especially in this wild track specification. And no surprise, it took first place in this mega test for safety. It has the most airbags, counting nine overall in the cabin, and the longest shopping list of active safety acronyms. And rounding out the podium performances in this regard is the GWM Ute Cannon and a tie for third place with the twins Mazda BT-50 and Isuzu D-Max all scoring well in the safety stakes. All of these Utes have relatively recent 5-star ANCAP safety ratings as well as good levels of standard safety equipment. Unsurprisingly, the Utes that struggled the most with safety were the oldest Utes in terms of their design and underlying platform. The Mitsubishi Triton picked up the wooden spoon for safety, missing out on some of the intervention in the existing technology that it has. The Toyota Hilux also scored poorly in this regard, with many elements like rear cross traffic alert and blind spot monitoring not on our test vehicle. Although Toyota has announced that an update will improve the safety credentials of the Hilux by the end of 2022. The Sangyong Musso was the only ute not crash rated by ANCAP in this mega test, and it has the least amount of airbags in the cabin at 6. And perhaps the worst thing is it still carries a lap style belt for the rearmost middle seat. And if you want every last detail in terms of safety of these dual cab utes and every other element that is important to buyers, you'll have to read our full mega test review at drive.com.au. Now, normally we'd be testing these dual cabs with things like off-road ability, load carrying and what they're like towing, but this is a different kind of mega test that we're doing this time around. We're focusing on family-friendly daily driver suitability for running around town because now 
in 2022. That's what so many people buy these dual cabs for. And that means things like steering, braking, ride and handling are all very important. How does the steering work at low speed when you're parking? How does that translate to high speed on the freeway? What's the ride and handling like? Do they soak up the worst road surfaces that our average road network can throw at them? And how practical are they for daily use? Is the cabin quiet? Is it insulated? Is it well put together? All vitally important for family buyers in 2022. The new Mazda BT50, joint winner of our most recent Drive Car of the Year Best Ute Award, uses Isuzu's 3-litre turbo diesel engine under the bonnet. It's called 4JJ3 TCX for all the nerds out there, and it makes 140 kilowatts and 450 newton meters. This runs through a six-speed automatic gearbox that is also shared with the Toyota Hilux along with the Isuzu D-Max. It's sourced from a company called Azen, which is partly owned by Toyota. 12 months ago, BT50 was right at the head of the class along with its twin, the Isuzu D-Max. And we're expecting that that might not be the case now because it has to contend with the all new Ford Ranger. But that doesn't mean that the BT50 is not still an exceptional dual cab to drive, especially day to day as we are testing here. The steering is beautifully light at low speed, but it doesn't feel too light once you get up to freeway speed. Ride and handling is excellent. It's not perfect, and like a lot of these dual cabs, it could be a little bit better, but it's still very good, especially over poor surfaces. And the relationship between that diesel engine, which we know is really good quality, and the automatic transmission is excellent. It's nice and smooth and that translates into really good fuel economy as well. Under the bonnet of the Isuzu D-Max is a three litre, four cylinder turbo diesel engine running through a six speed automatic transmission. While this all might sound a bit familiar to the previous generation D-Max, this is in fact a new powertrain overall with an engine developed in house by Isuzu. It makes 140 kilowatts and 450 newton meters, which sits it around the middle of the range for peak outputs. However, peak torque is available in a wider band of revs than most in this Isuzu. It's available between 1600 and 2600 RPM. So our reigning champion for best dual cab, the Isuzu D-Max, it'll surprise no one that this is still a really high quality offering for many of the reasons that we said about the BT50 already, obviously, because they're the same under the skin excellent engine, excellent gearbox. It's a really good thing to drive. And even in the face of newer, improved competition like the Ford Ranger, this is still a really smart choice. Recent updates to this Hilux powertrain, giving the 2.8 litre engine outputs of 150 kilowatts and 500 newton meters, pushes it towards the top of the pile in this comparison in terms of outputs. It's only beaten by the two litre Ranger by four kilowatts of power and is able to match it for torque. However, that peak torque is available in a wider band of revs in this larger Toyota engine. It's available between 1600 and 2800 RPM, which is a much wider breadth than the Ford motor. Now, if you stay up to date with drive, you'll know that the Toyota Hilux that I'm driving now won our off-road mega test. So there'll be a link to that review up above now that you can click on. And it's really interesting here on road around town because it's not the most up-to-date drivetrain here. However, it's still one of the best. Really tough engine, really good gearbox. They work well together. They're smooth and they're very, very efficient as well around town. The ride is not perfect, but none of these dual cabs are. And this remains one of the best. It's also got really good steering at either low or high speed. And all in all, this retains a lot of those Hilux strong points that make it such a good choice for family buyers. The Sangyong Musso has a 2.2 litre four cylinder turbo diesel engine, which makes 133 kilowatts and 430 newton meters. And that runs through a six speed automatic transmission with a part time four wheel drive system. This pins it as one of the lower performing powertrains in this mega test, only beating the GWM Ute for power and torque. I'll tell you the first thing that impresses you when you sit inside the Sangyong Muso. Have a listen to this. See, you can barely hear anything. It's quiet. It is incredibly well insulated inside this cabin. I think they've done a really good job of insulating engine and road noise and it's a really good thing to drive as well. The steering's got a little bit of weight to it, a little bit of heft compared to some of the others, which you notice at low speed. But aside from that, 
this Musso is a really impressive dual cab to drive. The ride quality is actually really good with one proviso over bigger, nastier bumps. You do notice a little bit of a jitter over smaller, repetitive bumps like corrugations. It's a little bit jittery, but I reckon that'd settle down if you put a bit of weight in the tray as well. But I think the important point with the Musso is if you're on a budget, you're not going to feel like you're getting a cheap dual cab if this is all you can afford. The Navara's 2.3 litre four-cylinder diesel engine uses two turbochargers in a sequential format to make 140 kilowatts and 450 newton meters. And that sits it in the middle of the range and it puts it right on par with the likes of the Isuzu D-Max and the Mazda BT-50. Nissan uses a seven-speed torque converter automatic transmission in the Navara, along with a part-time four-wheel drive system. It can be pretty hard to separate these dual cabs in this mega test because in effect, the top four, five, six of them all drive quite well. And that's true of the Navara. It can't match the leaders, vehicles like the Ranger and the Hilux, but the relationship between engine and gearbox, the steering, the way that it rides, the way that you can turn it at low speed, the manoeuvrability and the general balance of the Navara is all quite good. And while this doesn't sit right at the head of the segment in those disciplines, it's still a very accomplished dual cab. It's quite comfortable on most road surfaces. It does settle down a little bit with some weight in the tray like most of them. But all in all, despite the fact that with coil springs this could even be a little bit better again, this is still a very, very good dual cab. The Ford Ranger is one of the few utes with two options of engine in this high specification grade model. There is a carryover 2 litre turbo diesel called Bi Turbo, and this has been recalibrated for 154 kilowatts and 500 newton meters, running through a 10 speed automatic gearbox. Despite being the equal smallest in terms of capacity, this engine is the most powerful and it's the equal torquiest as well. There is also a 3 litre diesel V6 for this new Ranger and that makes 184 kilowatts and 600 newton meters and that runs through the same 10 speed automatic gearbox. And yet, even with the smaller engine, the new Ford Ranger is the best to drive in this segment. And it's probably no surprise either because the engineers at Ford have made changes to the engine. There's a new torque converter. They've recalibrated the way the drivetrain works. And this is a really exceptional dual cab to drive. It's quiet inside. The steering retains all of the old quality of the Ranger that we liked. And it still feels good at speed. This is just a really, really well executed platform. And it really does deliver on a lot of the factors that we're judging at the moment, which is what it's like to drive every day as a family vehicle. If I was putting my money down, if I was putting a deposit down, I'd be going with the V6, but there's a caveat to that. You're gonna have a much longer wait to get a new V6 Ranger than this four cylinder. So if you're impatient, grab the four cylinder, you'll still be happy. The headline point for new Ranger, regardless of which engine you opt for, is how effortless it is at doing all the things that family buyers will expect. Low speed manoeuvring around town, parking, shopping centre car parks, driving down narrow laneways, manoeuvring around town, speed humps, in and out of traffic, all that kind of stuff, this is exceptional at. And in short, it nails the brief of this mega test, which is around town, urban dual cabs for family buyers. Mitsubishi's 2.4 litre turbo diesel four cylinder engine isn't shared with any other manufacturer out there and is only found under the bonnet of the Pajero Sport as well as this Triton. It makes 133 kilowatts and 430 newton meters, which sits it towards the lower end of the stakes in terms of this competition through a six speed automatic transmission, which offers the flexibility of Mitsubishi's sophisticated super select four wheel drive system. Mitsubishi Triton might be starting to feel its age, but there's still some really good points. Super Select all-wheel drive is available, of course. Really strong, efficient engine that's got a reputation for being bulletproof and a smooth automatic gearbox. It rides quite well. The steering is also pretty good. And all in all, as this has been for some time, this is a really good value choice for those of you on a tight budget. The Ute Cannon has a 2 litre turbo diesel four cylinder engine under the bonnet, which makes 120 kilowatts and 400 newton meters. It's the equal smallest engine on this test, but it also has the lowest power and torque figures overall. This engine runs through an eight speed automatic gearbox with a torque on demand four wheel drive system that allows for all wheel drive on the bitumen. 
Now, the thing about Challenger brands like GWM is that they have all of the ingredients that you would expect from this segment, but it's sometimes just that little bit of extra polish, that little bit of fine tuning that they need to do. And it's understandable because a brand like GWM hasn't had decades to fine tune the way that Toyota has with a Hilux. So as such, the ride is not right at the head of the segment. It's good, but it's not fantastic. We think the throttle pedal on the GWM is a little bit sharp in that it's a little bit reactionary. It's not as soft as we'd like it to be. And the transmission doesn't always make the best decision. Sometimes it chops and changes between the gear that it's in. Overall though, this feels like a reasonable way to spend your money. And this is starting to shape up as a really good value pick for those of you on a tight budget. Picking up the wooden spoon in this comparison is the Mitsubishi Triton. It has long been the best valued choice in the segment, but new competition, an aging platform and increasing prices in recent years has taken the shine off this longtime favourite. It is still a solid ute in many respects, and it still rates well for ownership costs overall, but it falls short most sharply in the safety and infotainment stakes as well as the driving experience. It is a surprise to see this best-selling Hilux rate so low in this comparison, but the numbers in this case are inescapable. Like other utes that are getting on with age, this Hilux proved to be one of the smallest and least safe utes in this test. Infotainment is falling behind the pack and the ownership costs of the Hilux are relatively high. It is not all bad news however, and there are some important things that are good to note here. The powertrain is one of the best performers in this comparison, and the Hilux was also impressive in terms of the driving experience as well. So if elements like safety and technology are less important to some buyers, then the Hilux is still worth consideration. And don't forget, the Toyota Hilux was the winner of last year's Drive Off-Road Mega Test. That's a great video to watch and is well worth getting into. There is a lot to like about this Nissan Navara, one of the two utes in this comparison sporting coil springs in the rear. Recent updates to the infotainment system, including a segment rear 360 degree camera system helped a lot, and the Navara's responsive powertrain helped in the driving stakes. However, it is an ergonomically flawed ute in comparison to others, and it is noticeably lacking in terms of standard equipment and some safety elements. The GWM Ute Canon X might not be a name that rolls off the tongue easily, but this segment newcomer was able to overcome some of the established players in the areas of ownership costs, good safety credentials and overall dimensions inside and out. Less impressive was the driving experience of this Ute, including the lackluster powertrain. It was also missing some equipment, and while that infotainment system is quite big, it doesn't offer a great user experience. And that brings us to our top four. After some extensive testing and chewing over the facts and figures, there were some surprises and some that weren't so surprising. Let's find out how they got here. Perhaps the biggest surprise performance in this comparison was the ute from the Korean car maker Sangyong. Fourth is no mean feat in this company and the Musso was able to do it and topple many of the big names. It's the biggest ute, both in terms of internal and tub dimensions with this long wheelbase XLV variant and it proved to be one of the best in terms of cost of ownership as well. And along with a sharp drive away price, this Musso has a compelling seven year warranty and servicing offering. The powertrain, while it is smooth and refined, is one of the least impressive for outright performance and the driving experience of the Musso was also in the bottom half of this comparison. Safety is another weakness of this Musso, especially when you consider what some of the other newer utes are packing in this regard. And making an equal tie for second place are the twins under the skin, the Isuzu D-Max and the Mazda BT-50. Both of these utes impress with good ride quality, solid powertrain performance and high safety credentials. Technology is another one to talk about with impressive infotainment systems for both of these utes. However, there are some subtle differences between these two utes to consider. The D-Max was able to creep ahead with some additional storage space and cup holders on the dashboard while the BT-50 was able to creep ahead when we physically measured the amount of internal space on offer. The Mazda offers a five year unlimited kilometer warranty, while the Isuzu offers six years and 150,000 kilometer worth of coverage. The Isuzu is slightly cheaper to service overall, but the D-Max is also more expensive to buy. And Sam, surprise, surprise, we drove this individually. We knew it was a really good vehicle. We expected it to be impressive. Ford Ranger, new best dual cab on the market. 100%. Yeah. When I first drove this ute, I knew it was going to be a red hot chance at coming in on top here. And 
it's not really a surprise. Ford has put a lot of work and development and engineering into this Ranger in Australia, in fact, and the end result is quite impressive. This ute won a few categories outright, things like safety, that's very important. This is the safest ute in this comparison. Driving as well is very good. This has the bi-turbo. You can also get a V6, which is a very nice thing to have in this segment. But even in other segments, it still performed well across the board. Things like space, things like value for money, ownership, all those sorts of things. It's a very strong ute overall. Yeah, absolutely. Ford's done an incredible job with the new Ranger. And as we've found with this testing, the areas where you interact with it as a driver, the cabin, the way it feels on the road, all of that sort of stuff is really, really well catered to. It's a tight test in many ways. And you know, second and third place back there are still very, very good dual cabs. 100%. But this just is overall another step forward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Ford has done a great job of bringing this segment up to the next level, I think. I mean, you look at what Utes were doing 10 or 15 years ago, you were kind of compromising for that off-road yeah. ability and towing ability. They're a bit crude mm. and a bit compromised in a lot of ways. This, well, really isn't, right? It's comfortable, it's safe, it's refined. It's got a massive infotainment screen with all the bells and whistles. You're not really missing out on anywhere, along with having a good towing capacity and off-road capability. Yeah, absolutely. I'd go so far as to say this is probably the most car-like dual cab that we've ever tested, uh, and it feels that way on the road. Now, don't forget to hit like if you've... Actually, have you ever smashed the like button? Listen, I've smashed the like button and I've also dropped a few comments and I'd love if so you, you could did the do same that. Thing. If you agree yes. with us, leave some comments below. If they disagree with us. Yes, yeah, let us know. I, I don't mind reading those. Yeah, too. they always do that as well. Don't forget to hit like if you've enjoyed the video. Click on subscribe so you can stay up to date with all of our latest video content. And Sam, the full review, where is that? www.drive.com.au.